I want to welcome you all to the Alden House Historic Sites presentation of Untold Stories of Mayflower II. My name is Desiree Mobed, and I'm the Executive Director. Together with the Alden Kindred of America, we preserve and share the legacy of Mayflower passengers John and Priscilla Alden and their homestead in Duxbury, Massachusetts. I have no doubt you've heard all the official stories about Mayflower II, the much beloved replica of the vessel that brought the pilgrims to New England. Today, on this 64th anniversary of the ship's arrival to American shores, we're going to explore the unofficial stories, the juicy behind the scenes tales of the things we all really want to know. And we're honored to welcome back Randall Charlton for this fourth presentation. Randall is the son of Warwick Charlton, whose extraordinary vision and energy built Mayflower II as a gift to America. Randall's had a distingu distinguished career in journalism and business, and recently authored the book, The Wicked Pilgrim, the true story of the Englishman who gave Mayflower II to America. After Randall's talk, we encourage you to ask questions by typing them into the question and answer function on your screen. If you have to leave early or you'd like to share this program with others, a recording will be available on the Alden website. And now we'd like to welcome Randall Charlton joining us from across the pond. Welcome, Randall. Thank you so much, Desiree. It's a pleasure uh, to be joining you and many of the friends of Alden House on what apparently is a lovely day in America. It's an equally lovely day in England where I'm speaking to you. And um, I, perhaps I can make you a little bit jealous by indicating that one of my local coffee shops um, is the uh, ancestral home of the Mullins family, um, one of whom was Priscilla Mullins, who married John Alden, uh, who um, many of you, if not all of you, um, claim ancestry to. And I often enjoy um, a cup of coffee um, and uh, a cake and uh, the story of the Mullins family at that coffee shop in Dorking, England. But actually, the scene of a lot of the news right now is 200 miles to the southwest of us, uh, where President Biden is in Cornwall for the G7 summit. And I thought you might be interested to know that uh, last night, the day before the summit actually starts with all members of the different countries, uh, President Biden was at pains to um, refer to in one of his speeches, and this covered all the news, the special relationship uh, that existed between uh, Great Britain and the United States. He referred to, among other things, uh, the document that um, uh, FDR, President Roosevelt, had signed with um, Prime Minister Churchill in which they, among other, th other things, stated the mutual um, commitment of both the British um, and the American nation to preserving freedom and democracy for everyone. Now, what I'd like to do today is tell you another story which is related to the special relationship, uh, and it relates to you and your ancestors who came over on the first Mayflower. And um, I think it tells a very important story. Um, I want to focus on um, the precise replica of that first tiny sailing ship uh, that captured the interest of the, and the imagination of people around the world when it recreated the hazardous journey of your ancestors across the Atlantic um, to the barren shores of Cape Cod. In fact, today, June the 11th, 
is the anniversary of the arrival of at Mayflower 2 at Provincetown in 1957 after a storm-tossed journey of 53 days. In the last 64 years, Mayflower 2 has helped to bring to vivid life the early history of those first settlers. But many of the millions of Americans, perhaps including you, who have walked the decks of this startlingly small ship, have never heard the full story of how and why Mayflower 2 came to the shores of America. And today, I want to tell you some of the untold stories of Mayflower 2. Stories that I think would do justice to a Shakespeare play. Come to think of it, several Shakespeare plays. It's a tale of political intrigue, of misunderstanding, of comedy, of conflict, of romance, and above all, passion. The characters, believe it or not, include a little black kitten, a young soldier who saved 22 lives in a raging flood, a schoolboy whose graduation ceremony occurred in the mid-Atlantic, Britain's wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill, his son Randolph, and believe it or not, Ian Fleming, the man who wrote the James Bond stories. Now, I can't tell you all of those, but first let's look at a short video which will give you some clues to the secrets behind Mayflower 2. Warwick served during the Second World War in the 8th Army under General Montgomery and he got a very first-hand look at the contribution that the American nation gave both in terms of their people who fought and the American presidents and the American government's support long before they formally entered the Second World War for the Allies and he strongly believed that America should be encouraged to remain involved in Europe and have an interest in Europe. And he pondered the question over many years of how do you give a country that at that time appeared to have everything, something of value? And his answer was, you give them a piece of their history. And what better piece of their history could you give than the original Mayflower. Of course, the original Mayflower was broken up many years ago. The issue is, could you build a replica? And could that be a symbol of the friendship between the two English-speaking countries? He didn't want to do it himself. He never thought for a second that he would do it. He was a journalist. His passion and love was, after history, the media. And he kept trying to persuade his bosses, the owners of newspapers in Fleet Street, where the newspaper industry was based, to produce the money to build the Mayflower. And he, he would be the one to help publicize it. So he spent many years being politely but firmly told that no money would be forthcoming for this grand scheme. And remember, this grand scheme was in 1952, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Only five or so years after the end of the Second World War. It was a time of great austerity. You know, people were still rebuilding houses, rebuilding the infrastructure of a country that had been you know, severely damaged. There wasn't money for frivolous activities. And many people looked upon this as 
a little bit of a frivolous dream. He talked to anyone who would listen in Fleet Street and he was very well connected. And one day he got an introduction to a gentleman called Felix Fenston who had made a fortune after the Second World War on property. And he went to see Fenston, made his pitch, which he'd made hundreds of times. And Fenston gave him 500 pounds. And he then started to dream up one scheme after another to raise the rest of the money. And the long story short is he raised that money over two years. He had a genuine passion for history and he brought history alive for whoever he was talking to. So he produced a number of newspapers called Mayflower Magazine, which made clear to the reader the importance of, the, of Mayflower in the evolution of democracy in the 1600s and the early beginnings of democracy in America and how important it was. He then had the challenge of going to see someone in the shipbuilding industry with zero knowledge of what he was requesting. So although Brixham and Devon is probably best visited via train, which is very many efficient trains. He decided he had to make a grand impression. So he booked a, a flight to Exeter Airport and had Stuart Upham meet him there. He thought Upham might think he was more wealthy than he actually was. The two men apparently rode in silence pretty much the way down about to Brixham. And then Upham started talking about his experience with wooden ships and within a minute or so the two men turned on each other and one was shouting you've got to build it and the other says uh, was saying you know we can build it we must build it they basically fell upon each other and Warwick didn't consider going anywhere else from that point onwards They then started talking about how the ship would be built and Upham went into all sorts of detail about the need for plans and Warwick said well he got plans for a model how would that work and Upham said not really we've got to do better than that and the next thing was uh, they talked about what equipment they would use you know the tools they would use to build the ship and Warwick said, well, it must be historically accurate. To which Upham said, well, what do you mean? Well, we've got to use the tools they used in the 17th century. So Upham said, well, I'm not sure we've got many people who would know how to use all of those tools. So Warwick said, well, you've got to find somebody to train your people. To which Upham said, well, that's going to put the cost up a little bit. And Warwick said, I don't care. It, that that's the way it's got to be. It's got to be historically accurate as possible. The first ship went by the northern route, which was way more dangerous because, you know, going into a winter in particular, there was more likely to be bad weather, violent storms and, you know, and, and, and the risk of sheep shipwreck. The captain, Warwick wanted to go the northern route, but Captain Villiers told Warwick about three days when they were out to sea, he was going to take the long south route, go down off the coast of Spain and then across and then up the coast, which where the weather is uh, that time of the year was going to be dramatically better. So it was safer. And, you know, his logic was, uh, Villiers said, look, we're setting out on a ship that we're not really familiar with. They'd had something like a few days, not even weeks of sea trials pottering around Brixham Harbour and, and then Plymouth. So the ship hadn't been properly tested 
and Villiers knew there were going to be some problems with, you know, some of the features of the ship. So th they went the southern route rather than the shorter, more dangerous route. Now, he was forever trying to calculate when they would arrive as well, because he promised the people in America the ship would arrive somewhere around May the 26th. Now, the experienced sailors on board tried desperately to tell him you couldn't predict with a sailing ship because you couldn't predict the winds. And they kept saying, look, the sea and the winds are a fickle mistress. But that didn't stop Warwick sort of appearing at all times of the day and night and trying to calculate when they would arrive. It turned out to be almost more significant than Warwick had expected it to be. Then Mayflower actually helped to rebuild Anglo-American relationships very quickly. First of all, the Prime Minister of Britain resigned and Anthony Eden became the new Prime Minister. Eisenhower was re-elected by a landslide. And there was a period of wondering how to repair Anglo-American relations. So the word that there was a ship called the Mayflower II about to be built and sailed over was seized upon by many people in the media as well as politicians, not just in America, but all around the world as a possibility of helping to restore the normal strong bond between the two Anglo-speaking countries. Well, there you have it. Um, what a welcome that was, wasn't it? Do you see the crowds um, uh, lining the shore? Um, I've met some of the um, original uh, people who were there that day when they were just children, and it left a lasting impact on them. And um, I think that film, uh, which I've got to thank the BBC, um, for uh, their support and and the production um, of that short film gives you the big picture. Uh, the big untold story of Mayflower 2 is that the ship was, like the Statue of Liberty, a gift to you, the American people. You own it. It's your ship. And it was actually given to you by two Englishmen. My father, Warwick Charlton, who you see on the left, and his partner, John Lowe, on the right. And here's another interesting thought. The gift was, of course, to honour those first brave settlers who were, take, uh, who were uh, looking for freedom um, uh, um, from some of the autocratic rules that uh, governed uh, Europe and England. It was also, however, uh, to recognize the sacrifices of your parents and your grandparents, the so-called greatest generation, for their role in preserving freedom and democracy around the world in the first half of the 20th century. 
you know, why do I say that? Well, as I explained in my book, The Wicked Pilgrim, these two central characters uh, developed a lasting um, impression of the contribution of America and American people and what they'd given to the rest of the world. They actually couldn't have been more different. Um, and it was a strange partnership, actually. My father, um, as you probably have gathered, was a man of action um, with a love of history, a man who many described um, as possessed of great uh, creative energy and enthusiasm, who also had very strong political views, which he was happy to explain to anybody, no matter who they were, within earshot. John Lowe on the right, however, of this picture, although he was an impressive six foot tall man, uh, given to dressing in formal suits like you see here, and often wearing an English bowler hat, uh, was described as incredibly shy, a soft-spoken uh, man who sometimes, it was said, did not disturb any room he entered. Warwick, on the other hand, could turn it, uh, any room he entered into, into chaos in five minutes. However, both young men in their early 20s had seen the critical role of Americans uh, and, and the role they had played in preserving freedom and democracy. My father from the front lines of the battle, but John from the back rooms where secrets of war were uncovered. And both were convinced that without American invention, intervention in both the First and Second World War and your leadership in between, we might all have been living in a starkly different world. But let's set that serious thought aside for a minute or two on this lovely day and tell you some of the lighter untold stories of Mayflower 2. As I explain in my book, and the film you've just seen makes clear, my father spent years trying to persuade wealthy individuals to support his plan to rebuild Mayflower. When he decided that, although he possessed no financial resources and little of value beyond a decent wristwatch, he would have to do the job himself. He announced the plans uh, to the world in a press release that was issued to Reuters and the other news agencies and appeared all over uh, the Commonwealth and Europe on the four con uh, continents of the, uh, of the world. But he found a builder, he found plans for the ship when none existed, and after several months he had raised a small enough money, enough to finance and purchase one piece of wood which was fashioned into what was the keel of the prospective ship. And here you see that piece of wood. Now, with no idea where the rest of the amount, large amount of money uh, he needed was coming from, my father decided to organize a keel laying ceremony. He decked the shipyard with flags, had a military band provide the music and a vicar with a blessing to an assembled crowd of VIPs. And he invited representatives of the world's media uh, to Brixham in the southwest of England to this tiny little way out of uh, fishing village to witness the start of construction. But it was only one lonely piece of oak that would become the keel of the ship. But with a sense of history, my father searched for a descendant of the passengers who sailed on the original Mayflower. And he found a member of the Winslow family. Here you see Commander Winslow with a hammer in his hand, right in the middle of the picture, underneath the flags, blessing uh, uh, the, uh, the keel, which for months would be all that there was of Mayflower II, a lonely stick, because that's all he could pay for. We look at the next slide. Two years later, 
amazingly, my father invited the world's press back to the shipyard. He had miraculously found the money to build his ship. But, but in what could have been a moment of triumph, he disappointed and actually um, irritated many of his backers, including uh, leading British admirals, politicians and VIPs, who were now all interested in officiating at the launching ceremony. Instead, and this will give you a clue to my father's character, he wanted a regular American to launch the ship. And he tracked down a man and his wife living thousands of miles away in Toppenish, Washington State. And you see him here with the ceremonial mug that he threw into the water um, after launching the ship. As a junior officer in the US Air Force, this young man who was living quietly in Washington State, um, uh, Reese Fleming, had been deployed to the east of England a few years earlier when there was a serious flood. And Mr. Lemming, who could not swim, donned a life jacket and proceeded to rescue 22 English people who were all in grave danger of drowning. 22 people. The Queen gave him the George Medal, Britain's highest award for bravery. And my father thought that the modest Mr. Lemming and his wife represented the average American to whom the boat was dedicated with great dignity. Now, the launch, there was more than one drama um, when the, the masts were added and the ship was ready uh, to sail. And it looked anything but dignified as she sped, sped down the shipway. Gathering speed and she nearly keeled over and sank to the bottom of Brixham Harbour. One news reporter gave May Mayflower only a 50-50 chance of making it across the Atlantic. The crew were immediately offered the chance to withdraw. None did. Instead, they formed what they called a 50-50 club for those that sailed on Mayflower 2. And that club survived once a year. And it's worth pointing out that that club has been nurtured by an American lady, um, Marietta Mullen, who lives in nearby Plymouth, uh, Massachusetts who has devoted many years of her life to preserving untold stories of who built Mayflower 2, how and why they did it, and the stories of the 33 crew members. The problem, by the way, and some of you sailors may have guessed it, was that Mayflower 2 was like its predecessor, um, not meant, um, uh, to carry passengers. It was developed to carry um, goods to and from uh, the European coast, things like cases of uh, casks of wine and so on. And Mayflower 2, like its predecessor, was actually quite badly built um, and it was top heavy. The issue, however, was easily fixed um, when one of Warwick's Admiral uh, advisors uh, suggested uh, several tons of railway iron uh, should be um, deposited in the hull uh, so that the ship um, uh, had a lower aspect in the water. And that leading admiral actually advised Warwick to dispense with sea trials because he said quietly, the admiralty could delay the sailing for a long time until they were satisfied that Mayflower 2 was fit to travel. So after a few days pottering about in Brixham and Plymouth Harbour and no sea trials, Mayflower 2 set off across the vast Atlantic Ocean bound from America. There was more drama to follow before the ship was out of sight of English shores. 
guess what? A stowaway was discovered in the hold of the ship. And the crew downed him in uh, slops from the cook's quarters before dumping him overboard to be picked up by a motorboat. To the annoyance of the ship's captain, my father was behind what was, in fact, a publicity stunt. And in the following week, the stowaway would appear on primetime television uh, singing, I wish I'd sailed on the Mayflower. The truth was that although the ship was by now attracting the rapt attention of the world's press and people all over the globe, my father, who was on board, could not relax. He was terrified that once out to sea, Mayflower 2 would be forgotten. In fact, the world set aside their daily worries and followed the ship's progress for almost two months every day. Even when nothing was happening, headlines appeared around the world announcing things like Mayflower be calmed, no progress today. But wait, there was a second stowaway. And this one was called Felix. And you see young Felix being held by Graham Nunn, uh, the, the UK cabin boy. And Felix was welcomed by all on board when the crew wrote a message at one point in the journey, put it in a bottle to be thrown overboard. Before doing so, they put ink on one of the paws of Felix and added his signature to those of the crew. Several months later, a bemused Norwegian walking on his northern shores one morning would find and open the washed ashore bottle to discover that the sailing ship had been invited, uh, uh, sorry, that, that, the, that he'd been invited by a cat to a free dinner at the Wigan Pen Club in London. And a year later, he claimed his prize. On arrival in America, Felix would become and this is another untold story, a feline illegal immigrant and would find a home in Massachusetts where he apparently mistook the drapes in his new home for Mayflower sails, sails that he'd loved to climb during the journey. And believe it or not, the drapes in that house were destroyed over a few short months. My father carried his interest in historic reenactment to extremes when he insisted that the ship's doctor take some leeches on board on the grounds that they'd been used in the 1600s to bleed the sick. That was the, uh, the medical uh, advice at the time. Since there were no volunteers, my father offered his chest as a feeding ground for the leeches. And guess what? Those poor leeches died the following day, which may, may say something about the strength of my father's blood. While the crew laughed at my father's effort to embrace 17th century medical practice, there was a, coincidentally a modern political crisis between England and America. Relations fell time an all time low. And Mayflower played an important role in resolving it. The problem, as in off is often the case uh, in our world, arose in the Middle East, where Egypt nationalized the Suez Canal, a shipping lane that was vital to Britain's trade links. Britain, or the government, had forgotten it was no longer master of an empire on which the sun never set and it invaded Egypt without consulting their principal ally and the country which had taken over the role of leadership of the free world, the United States. President Eisenhower, who was running for re-election at the time, was understandably furious, and Anglo-American relations were severely trained. Here you see uh, the problem with the government of um, England dressed in pilgrim uh, cloth on the uh, 
uh, on land, waving Mayflower 2 um, away um, uh, and uh, with messages like, um, all's okay, I, I, Ike, and pray, praise rather than damn Dulles, who was um, uh, one of um, uh, President Eisenhower's chief advisors and foreign secretary. After yielding to Eisenhower's demands withdraw from Egypt, the British government sought to repair the damage with a visit by the new Queen Elizabeth, accompanied by a flotilla of naval vessels, including the aircraft carrier, the Art Royal. They sailed to Jamestown, Virginia to show off Britain's remaining military might. And at the same time, my father's gift to America was on its way to Cape Cod. Mayflower headlines embarrassingly uh, completely obscured uh, the visit uh, to Jamestown. The truth was that senior members of the British government had at that time no enthusiasm for either my father or the Mayflower project. They fretted about my father's liberal anti-royalist views and they thought the sight of a tiny 16th century wooden sailing ship would, would send precisely the wrong message uh, to America. A message that England had not nothing to offer the post-World World War, uh, but its history. They were wrong. So it's sometimes somewhat ir ir ironic that the appearance of Mayflower did so much to repair the special relationship between our two countries. However, it has to be said that the British government's lack of support for the Mayflower voyage did much to undermine the relationship between my father and the people in Plymouth to whom my father had decided to entrust the ship. Close to American shores and, and safety, Mayflower 2 nearly sank again in a severe storm that engulfed the little wooden vessel at nightfall. All hands appeared on deck as Captain Villiers decided that he had to ride out the storm under bare poles. Villiers stood at the helm for several hours as the little vessel rocked and rolled, bobbing helplessly like, like a little cork in the heavy seas. Captain Villiers was probably the best man in the world at that time to bring the ship th through the storm safely. And as I explain in the book, he had assembled a core crew of very experienced sailors who had sailed with him on many other wooden voyages on wooden ships. However, here you see two complete novices tugging on the ship's ropes. My father and his friend, Dick Brennan, behind him. Back in England, Dick Brennan was the manager and part owner of the Wigan Pen Club, a fine dining restaurant. And my father had persuaded Dick to reserve a table for him facing the front door during his years of his Mayflower project. And it actually became my father's second office. His real office was a tiny cramped affair in the city of London, a mile or so away, where John Lowe, my father, and two members of staff could barely fit in at the same time. So when dad was entertaining visitors from America and potential English backers or supporters in one form or another, Warwick would meet them at the Wigan Pen to dine on uh, traditional English fare, steak and kidney pudding and roast beef, roast lamb, that sort of thing. In return, Dick Brennan, made Warwick promise to take him on Mayflower if and when the ship was built. Now, <laughs> my father agreed and then forgot about his promise. 
And one day, Dick's wife, Babs, um, collared Warwick as he was leaving and said, look, you know, um, Dick has got us uh, um, sail on the ship on Mayflower uh, as a cook. Um, and if, if he doesn't, um, he'll have a heart attack and die. Um, <laughs> so Warwick, suitably embarrassed, consulted with Captain Villiers, who he'd put in charge of assembling the crew. And Villiers already had a cook. So <laughs> what happened was that this um, owner of a fine dining restaurant, um, as a compromise, was appointed the deputy cook. So Mayflower 2 sailed to America <laughs> with someone who knew about haute cuisine um, as the second cook. So Mayflower 2 had two stowaways and two cooks. Um, next, I want to show you another novice, a um, young man called Joe Meany, who you see on the left, who, and this is, I think, an untold story, had a... Uh, he'd been um, selected from uh, the Boys Club of America after a year-long national competition um, in which he was given his prize by former president Herbert Hoover uh, to sail um, representing American youth on the ship at my father's request. He said, we've got to have one American on board at least. And uh, he missed his graduation at home in Massachusetts. So Warwick organized a graduation sail uh, uh, ceremony uh, they found something that they fashioned into an academic um, uh, gown and a mortarboard. And the shy young boy was treated to a, a unique graduation ceremony by Captain Villiers, who you see here with his um, formal uniform on, who summoned all hands on deck. And the story has a wonderful ending because an American philanthropist who read um, in a report at the time in 1957, um, said, well, when this boy gets ashore, um, I'm going to finance his four years um, at uh, university, which he did. So on this very day, June the 13th of uh, 1957, uh, Mayflower 2, came through the storm and arrived on land at Provincetown. And Warwick, my father, with his ever-present sense of history, invited an American poet, Harry Kemp, I think he was known as the poet of the D dunes, to witness a reenactment of the Mayflower Compact, the document signed by all the male passengers on board the original Mayflower in 1620 a document that is believed to have contributed to the establishment of the American constitution. And on shore, uh, the people of Provincetown um, uh, distributed copies of the compact to everyone that was crowded, crowding that uh, narrow, uh, those narrow streets of that town, uh, which is pretty much um, the entire population of the place. Two days later, the crew were greeted by a large crowd of several thousand um, who crowded from every vantage point. And you can see back here um, uh, in Plymouth Harbor. Um, and one of the first to welcome them was a Brewster, a descendant of, it's Bill William Brewster, a descendant of the original Brewster who arrived um, in 1620. And it's worth pointing out that here you see the shallop, which, by the way, I think is going to be in Duxbury um, uh, this weekend or next weekend. And I, I'd urge you to have a look at it. Uh, that was built um, by folks at Plymouth uh, to row uh, the people ashore. Um, and when they arrived, uh, my father insisted entire crew dressed in pilgrim costumes. He believed that it was important to give people strong visual signals 
to help them take their imagination back in time. And from what I hear about the exciting plans of your organization or at Alden House, uh, they're embracing that concept of bringing uh, history to life uh, with uh, you know, live, um, wherever possible, um, uh, exhibitions. Then after Plymouth and a welcome from, uh, Vice President Nixon and, and Senator Kennedy and Senator Solsenstall and, and several other VIPs, it was off to New York City. Uh, and this picture, which was taken by National Geographic, they voted their picture of the century. And you're going to love this untold story. Well, it was told at the time, but has maybe been lost over time. Uh, one of your cousins, uh, a young lady, 22 year old Priscilla Alden Kiefer, uh, was appointed the mystery of ceremony, mistress of ceremonies and the greeter in chief um, at a ticker tape parade uh, through uh, New York City. And here you see, look at that crowd. Isn't it amazing? And um, behind the crowd, you see, um, you, you see the crew uh, still dressed in their uniform. Um, and um, I forget the number of people who were there, but it was a really huge number. Uh, the ship spent the summer in New York, then went down to Miami to an enthusiastic welcome before returning to Washington, D.C. Then back to Plymouth, where it has generated tens of millions of dollars for, for Plymouth Plantation. Now, as I think you know, uh, called Plymouth Portuxet. That's far from the end of the untold stories. There's the story of uh, the wartime prime minister, um, uh, Winston Churchill, supported uh, Mayflower when many other politicians uh, were loath to, um, of uh, Ian Fleming, uh, the author of James Bond books, um, who introduced him uh, to a lot of friends that he had in, in, in the high up in the Navy. Uh, but the bottom line is my father spent two years lecturing around America and he went to over 30 states talking to audiences about the importance of the Mayflower voyage, the importance of the Mayflower compact and his reasons for the gift uh, to America and his hopes that revenue from the ship would be used to fund Anglo-American scholarships uh, to contribute to the bond between our two countries. My father died in 2002, and during his lifetime, unfortunately, neither John Lowe nor my father were welcomed back to Plymouth by the directors of Plymouth Plantation. But he had many good friends among the individuals who worked daily to look after the ship, and his ashes were buried in the hull of Mayflower II. I think the reasons why Plymouth Plantation directors were reluctant to tell my story were mixed. It was in part, I think, due to the negative views that members of the British government gave at the time to the folks at Plymouth while he was building the ship and, uh, and, and trying to raise the money. It was also in part because the Plymouth folks wanted the ship, but they had absolutely no interest in using surplus exhibition revenue for my father's Anglo-American scholarship scheme. And in part because my father was ironically far more liberal and alarmingly democratic than his American partners. He recognized this. And I remember in one reflective mood when I was interviewing him for his book, he admitted to me that sometimes he may have, as he put it, sailed a bit too close to the wind. Here's a picture of him late in life at his home in England with his dog. Um, a passionate Democrat to the end. He named his dog Oliver Cromwell after the famous anti-royalist 
who ruled England after the English Civil War uh, for a period um, that resulted in the temporary uh, removal of the monarchy for a five-year period. My father would have loved to have known that his ship was lovingly renovated in 2019 at Mystic Seaport and it has now become officially designated a national treasure. That's wonderful. And of course, he would have added his vote for Mayflower 2 to the 27,000 plus Americans who I understand voted this ship, the people's choice, as the most outstanding historical restoration project. And he would have loved knowing that Nathaniel Philbrick, that distinguished uh, historian and author, described his gift to America at its relaunching in 2019 as a famous ship in its own right. But my father Warwick Charlton was not one to dwell on praise and he was always looking to the future and I can imagine him if he heard me talking right now getting impatient pacing up and down and begin lecturing anyone within hearing distance about the critical importance of protecting and preserving the democratic principles that have made America the greatest nation on earth. In 2019, I decided it was time to honor my father's wishes to start a scholarship program, which had been a huge part of his reason for building Mayflower II. The first scholarship went to a student at the University of Plymouth in England. The second to a very enthusiastic and talented young assistant at Alden House last year and I'm working with Alden House on two more scholarships. So in conclusion I hope I've given you a flavor of the drama, the political retreat, uh, intrigue and the fun of my father's Mayflower adventure but there is I assure you a lot more to the story including in the book over 100 pictures, some of which you've seen today, a few of them anyway, uh, and you will find them uh, in his lengthy biography. Thank you all for listening. Oh, Randall, that was absolutely fascinating. And I'm going to echo um, an encouragement to buy that book, not only as Father's Day, right around the corner, but this is an incredibly fun read. You will learn so much, you'll have a lot of laughs, and you'll be so inspired. Uh, I think I'm still going to be laughing for a long time, Randall, about thinking about Felix the cat climbing yeah. those drapes, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wanting to help sail that house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but um, really, you mixed it was just wonderful stories that you told. And um, even after reading the book, you know, learning things along the way. I, I'd, I'd like to ask, I know we have questions coming in um, that I will share with you, but I'd also like to ask... When your father gave his talks, you know, which obviously he did quite a bit, what seemed to be his favorite story? Which, which one of these did he seem to sort of be the go-to story? Um, which one did my father enjoy most? Um, I, I think he had a very good friendship with Randolph Churchill during the war. Uh, who was Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister's son. Um, and um, Warwick at one point went to him in those early days when all he had was the keel and he couldn't get anybody else to put up anything. I think he had just 500 pounds at the time. And for months he was getting polite interest and polite nose. And Randolph Churchill turned to him and he said, well, don't be silly, Warwick you have no credibility. <laughs> Warwick said, what do you mean? And it, I've done some research. He said, look, you're nothing to do with the sea. Uh, you've never sailed in, a, in any ship, have you, apart from wartime when you came home on an American troop ship. Uh, you know nothing about the sea. What you need to do is find some admirals um, who you can put on your letterheading paper as supporters and patrons. I'm going to introduce you to Ian Fleming. And Warwick said, well, Ian Fleming, he writes books about James Bond, doesn't he? 
Yes, he said, but his, he is currently dating a lady who is the daughter of one of the chief admirals in the British Navy. And that gives him a lot of friends within the senior um, British uh, Admiralty. And that's how Warwick got a lot of the, of the um, uh, if you call it the um, establishment of, of Britain to gradually come round and think, well, maybe this man isn't so mad as we think he is. Uh, we'll lend our name to, to his project, which they did. That's, that, that's a lot of fun. So let's get to some of these uh, comments and questions from some of our wonderful attendees. So Nancy comments that she's read the book, Randall, and was gobsmacked yeah. by the perseverance of your father. I think we all are. It, it takes a tremendous amount of energy and perseverance, but he, he was really the right man for this job. He was. He was, he was um, described by his immediate boss um, uh, uh, and... and in, in, in the Second World War, when he was on the staff, personal staff of General Montgomery, as a man possessed of a manic energy, manic energy, and create, sustained creative genius, who helped um, produce newspapers um, in the North African desert, almost on his own, on stolen presses. Um, uh, and, and these newspapers were important at the time when British morale uh, was at a very low ebb and the soldiers were being uh, pushed back right across um, the North African desert. And then of course, um, my father got a first-hand look of Amer American generosity um, when some Sherman tanks uh, started appearing. Uh, tanks that had been built in Detroit and were actually very easy to repair. And that helped turn the whole war around. All right, Linda wants to know who or what was the first stowaway who, dumped, who got dumped into the sea? And I'd like to add, I mean, clearly since you said it was a public relations sort of plan, um, you know, they must have had counted on really good weather to dump that poor guy in the sea at just the right point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My father wasn't one to worry about what the weather was like. I've got to tell you, other than when it was becalmed, he didn't want it. He, he wanted wind because he wanted to get to America tomorrow if he could. Um, but I, I do you know I can't remember the name of the young man that my father solicited, but he did have a motorboat um, follow the ship. Um, a, a few minutes after all the other um, people who were saying goodbye to Mayflower um, from motorboats or whatever had turned around and gone back to Plymouth Harbour. Um, and, um, but my father, of course, didn't tell either Captain Villiers or the other members of the crew that this young man uh, w was not a real stowaway. <laughs> he, uh, uh, and, and, and they got very upset when he was discovered, hauled him up to um, uh, on deck, doused him on, you know, in sort of cabbage leaves and potato peelings or whatever. Uh, and then <laughs> but they were literally going to uh, um, get a bit uh, rough with him and uh, Warwick said, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. We can't hurt the poor man. Uh, but look, there's a motorboat coming. And, and of course, at that point, Captain Villiers realized that it was a, a publicity stunt. And the man was um, gently, more or less gently allowed down into the water and picked up right away by the motorboat. And Warwick had a friend uh, called Huey Green, who ran a talent show, which was the the biggest uh audience rating um uh, at the time um on um i think it was on itv um and and this young man appeared and sang this song i wished i i'd sailed on the mayflower um 
the thing was, my father had spent two years sort of almost willing people to support his project. Um, and, and, and he couldn't believe it when he was so successful um, and it was unnecessary to uh, get involved in further promotion because everyone was uh, following Mayflower's um, moves with rapt attention. All right, and a question from Paul. Um, with two cooks, what were the usual meal likes on the Mayflower? And the other question that was asked earlier, which I'll, I'll roll into this one, is that wig and pen still in existence? I think we all want to go at our first opportunity. Yeah, sadly, it's not. Um, uh, and, you know, the world has moved on. At the time the Wigan Pen was founded, and I would encourage any visitors uh, to England to walk past the place where, um, you know, the building still stands. Um, the Wigan Pen Club was a club immediately opposite the law courts, right? So that's where the word wig comes from. You know, it was barristers and judges who would pop across the road from the law courts in between cases and having lunch or, or drink. And then it was at the top end of Fleet Street, which is the home, was the home of every newspaper of any note. And it was a wonderful building. I was actually um, a member of the club for many years. But what happened was that with the decline of the newspaper industry, um, in order to save money, a lot of the newspaper owners moved out of uh, the high rent district that Fleet Street was. And that meant that the Wigan Pen lost half its membership. And if you can, you know, as someone who's been a journalist myself, um, I can say um, that um, journalists um, are very hard workers, um, but they also can play quite hard. And <laughs> then they're, they're known to enjoy good food and drink, uh, particularly after their stories have gone to press. So that uh, that place was an absolutely wonderful place to go because you go in there and you would see some of the top journalists and, and writers and, um, uh, and photographers of the time, as, as well as um, a few judges uh, and um, lawmen. Now, as far as the food is concerned, um, this is where my father got a lot of support um, from British corporation and, and American corporations. Um, the Heinz Company, for example, provided a lot of the food for the journey. So the crew on the second journey ate significantly better than those on, uh, of your ancestors um, that went on the first journey. <laughs> Oh, that's good to know. I, I have a feeling there was a lot less of that dreadful, you know, uh, hard tack and um, this everlasting salted meat and peas. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah, was, so, yeah, go ahead. Well, Randall. Sorry, I was going to say to your point, there was some salted meat because my father, you know, at every opportunity, he said, look, we, we've got to get as close to uh, the way it was back then as we possibly can. So there was some salted meat. There was some hard biscuits. There were also some very good biscuits from mm. uh, Huntley and Palmer and, you know, other brand names that you would recognize today. And there was even, I have to say, um, some gin from uh, the Plymouth Gin Company. So they didn't go short of food on a uh, good food on the journey. So another very good question, and the food um, ties into that, is did your father, and this is from Teresa, did your father keep a daily diary? And what entry did you find the most exciting? Oh, that's, that's an excellent question. The answer is he did. He, took, he um, kept a daily diary and... Um, it occupies quite a lot of his book, which is 
now out of print, but if someone wants to email me at randall, R-A-N-D-A-L dot charlton at comcast.net, I'll do my best to get a copy of uh, his diary or um, uh, I may be able to guide them to a copy of his um, book that was published in 1957. Um, and there's some wonderful stuff in that book. Um, uh, I'm just wondering where I could find um, something. I, um, I'll just have a quick look and see if I can find... Um, one or two paragraphs. I mean, he was a really good writer. I think that's the only thing I would say. Um, I can't lay my hands on the paragraphs in, in this, in my biography of him, which runs to 436 pages. So I apologize, but send me an email and I'll send you some of his paragraphs, but uh, some of his diary. I think the, um, uh, you know, he gives an interesting view of the people he met, um, you know, the sailors and the crew. Um, he talks about, um, you know, the, the war and what people went through. Um, uh, and he also talks about Mayflower and he tries to describe uh, in particular, I remember one description of her being pulled into Plymouth Harbour and he's, he runs out of descriptions, which is rare for him, of how to describe Mayflower. At one point, he said she was surrounded by all these small ships and at one point it felt like she was a mother hen with all her chickens surrounding her. But he said, that's not right because she was too majestic for that. And then he went to another description and said, that wasn't right. Uh, and then another, oh, that's not right. And he recorded it in his diary. And he said, you know, in the end, I just gave up and enjoyed the moment. All right, another question from John. Uh, your mother once told us at a crew reunion event that, um, at Plymouth Plantation, uh, yeah. that years after the sale, your father planned to kidnap Mayflower too and bring it back across the Atlantic <laughs> as another marketing well, um, adventure. And he yeah. wants to, you to comment on that. <laughs> right. Well, uh, I'm not quite sure that he planned to kidnap. <laughs> that, that, and yeah, he, he didn't plan to kidnap. What he did have, and I was with him at the time, because I was working in uh, America, as I have done for 30 years, um, I went up from my, my then home in Connecticut with him to Plymouth Plantation with a proposal to give to uh, the, the trustees of Plymouth Plantation to sail the ship back to England um, uh, as a... Um, as a message of uh, another message of goodwill, and then it would come back again to America. And, um, you know, unfortunately, he got um, no support from anyone um, at Plymouth Plantation. Um, you know, my father was not, he was a man without fear. Um, and, um, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, in the early days, um, somebody said to um, uh, Warwick, um, well, how on earth are you going to insure the ship? Uh, because it's 16th century, in which at that time they didn't know how to build um, uh, best, you know, to best specifications. Um, no one knows how to sail a ship of that sort. Uh, you're at high risk. And he said, oh, don't worry, uh, we'll get Lloyd's to um, insure it for full value. And here's why. Both the builder, Stuart Upham, and myself are going to sail on the ship. That ought to give the insurers plenty of confidence. 
<laughs> so that was his approach. And of course they did. But when <laughs> Lloyds came back and said, look, we'll, we'll definitely insure the ship. He said, that's not enough. I want you to write a policy in the language of the 1620s, <laughs> right? And Lloyds actually went back and did detailed research and they found three policies that um, of that age and every um, and, and the policy is something is, it's a work of art. Um, Warwick insisted that every one of the partners who took part of the risk um, wrote their names in handwriting and the amount of protection they were given. So there would be John Doe insuring for five thousand uh, dollars, you know, Jane Doe um, six thousand dollars and so on. Interesting document in its own right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we are really pushing our time. I know people have had a lot of questions. If we haven't gotten to them, um, we can respond to you afterwards. We'll certainly save these questions. But I did want to end, Randall, with a couple of questions from a very special lady in the audience whom you know, um, who wanted to ask a little bit more about the Charlton Scholarship. And so I thought that might be a nice way to wrap this up. Sure, it would. And um, I'm, I'm really delighted to have formed a partnership um, uh, with Alden and Alden House because um, for one reason or another, um, my father's, one of my father's main wishes uh, relating to uh, his gift to the American people was to set up a scholarship program uh, that encouraged young people um, who were just going to college or whatever um, uh, from America to visit Britain and vice versa uh, to study our, our, our joint culture. You know, there were the scholarships, there was the Fulbright scholarship and uh, the Marshall Fund had a whole range of scholarships, but these are set were essentially for talented people or mature people, high in government or medium level in government or high in academia. Warwick wanted a scholarship for the youth who were finding out all about America. And um, in 2019, I decided, although, um, you know, I'm not independently wealthy, that um, as Warwick would say, it's time to stop huffing and ahhing and, and, and get off your backside and do something, uh, Randall, or you're no son of mine. So I um, introduced um, uh, first a scholarship with the University of Plymouth, and they sent one of their PhD students across to um, help gather material for the new museum called the Box Museum down in Plymouth, which has been built for last year's celebrations. And I encourage everyone to take a look at it. Um, and then more recently, uh, there's someone who is at Alden House right now who we supported. Very nice young lady um, uh, and very hardworking and talented um, lady um, to support her in a little way. And we've got two other scholarships um, that we are uh, contemplating. And, you know, I would love to hear, as I'm sure Alden House would, um, uh, anyone who is interested in joining with us um, to build an endowment that would guarantee um, over the long period um, regular annual Anglo-American scholarships because coming back to the beginning uh, you know my father and many others those in high office uh, have a strong belief in the importance of the Anglo-American culture and Alden descendants were right there at the beginning of establishing this culture. They were, you know, all those Mayflower settlers were from Britain. Uh, you know, the presidents, uh, Orson Welles, Marilyn Monroe, and all the other intelligent, beautiful, um, and um, successful uh, members of the, what is now a massive Alden um, family. So we'd love to work with others and, um, you also have a capital campaign, which um, I, I very much hope that those, those listening will support because I think you're doing wonderful work 
and important work. Thank you, Randall. Um, again, I want to thank you all for attending. If you're interested in buying Randall's book, you can check it out on the Alden website and also on Mayflower Event News. Um, that's another site that Randall is part of. Um, if you're interested in learning about Alden House, please visit our website. There's information posted there about the capital campaign that Randall so nicely mentioned. If you're in Duxbury, please stop by the museum. This is a fabulous story um, that the Aldens have been sharing for almost 400 years here during their residence. It is um, the start, part of the beginnings of this country and we offer guided tours and programs throughout the year. Alden.org is the website. We look forward to having you join us at another time. Randall, thank you again for another fabulous program and we'll look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you very much for joining us today. <laughs>